Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about technology, and I think there are many things that actually uh, connect with Sue's talk, but I'll tell them from my own perspective, which is that of a computer scientist. And uh, I have always had a fondness for science fiction, um, and I believe that in many ways we are now living in a science fiction world, so I'll connect a lot of these things to uh, various uh, pieces of science fiction. And I'm going to begin with uh, um, a story by Isaac Asimov, the great science fiction author, uh, in 19. 86, towards the end of his life, he wrote this book, uh, Foundation in Earth, and in it, um, the year is 25,066. Uh, human beings have colonized the galaxy, uh, but the galactic empire is crumbling, and uh, on offer are three different visions for how humanity might move forward. Uh, one vision is proposed by a political elite uh, that has been used to governing, um, but whose manipulative tendencies uh, many people don't trust. Uh, the other, a second one is offered by a business-savvy upstart, uh, promising to make the universe great again. Um, and so, basically, that shows you that after 23,000 years, not much will have changed. Uh, the third vision I'm not going to spoil for you, but one thing that's revealed in this book is that uh, Isaac Asimov decided that he was going to uh, weave together all the strands of his different uh, um, areas of fiction. And what uh, he discloses is that throughout the course of galactic history, a single godlike humanoid robot by the name of R. Daniil Oliva has been secretly nudging things in a direction so that humanity prevents itself from destroying itself. Um, in interviews, Asimov used to say that he really didn't like dystopian um, science fiction. He thought it was too dark and didn't paint a positive picture of how the world could be. And so he intentionally tried to create a world in which technology worked in favor of uh, humanity. And this is an inc you know, incredible example that a single robot was basically trying to move things so that human beings would have a thriving uh, civilization. So the question is, what was it about his robot, about his idea of the world that is different from a lot of the other science fiction that is out there? And for that, you have to go back in time not only uh, in his own galactic chronology, but also in his own authorship. Uh, when he was 22 years old, he wrote his first uh, robot-based science fiction story. It was called Runaround. And in it, he raised the idea that robots should have rules, built-in rules that govern them. Uh, and that first rule is something called the uh, law of robotics. Uh, and it basically says that a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Now, what's interesting is that Asimov predicted that robots would start happening in the early 21st century, and here we are today, and amazingly, more and more, there are, in fact, real robots, not just in factories, but increasingly affecting our everyday life. Uh, my own um, approach to this subject is that I used to do research in artificial intelligence in an area called computer vision. Uh, some of my work was a precursor to Microsoft's Kinect system. Um, but I also moved to India in 2004 to, to see if I could find ways to apply digital technology to help solve some of uh, humanity's uh, challenges, whether it was poverty, agriculture, healthcare, education, and so forth. And um, I'm not going to go into too much of that, but to summarize what I learned, I came away with this single, very very simple um, idea that is out there, but which I don't think is sufficiently appreciated. And that is this, that for the most part, the, uh, the impact of technology is to amplify underlying human forces. Uh, this is a very simple idea, but I want to emphasize that it's primarily only to amplify and not specifically to make the world a better place. So let's see how this works uh, in the context of um, a very large country like the United States. So on this graph, the bottom green line in particular shows the rate of poverty in the United States. Uh, from the 1940s until about 1970, the rate of poverty in the United States steadily declined. But since 1970 or so, it has basically flattened. Uh, our war against poverty has stagnated. Um, interestingly, during that same 40 or 50 years, uh, we have had an explosion in all kinds of technologies, right? So if you believe that digital technology in and of itself 
its invention, it, uh, its going mainstream, is the reason why the world becomes a better place, then this graph shows you that that's not the case. Something else also needs to happen. Uh, it used to be um, exactly as Sue mentioned that um, we used to think that technology would help connect us and that by connecting us better, we would become more empathetic towards each other, understand each other's problems better, and come to some kind of uh, uh, agreement about the world. Uh, if anything, exactly the opposite has happened. Uh, during the same period of time when we've had an, a golden age of uh, digital technology, we have seen increasing political polarization. Uh, sometimes I have people who say, well, what about all of the texting for different humanitarian causes that we do? Um, here, too, there's not that much of an effect of digital technology. Uh, since 1970, statistics show that the rate of charitable giving by um, the average American citizen has stayed about 2% of total GDP. Not much change, despite the fact it is, that it is much easier to give. And if you think about it a little bit, it's obvious why. Um, just because the tools to give become uh, more uh, easier to use doesn't mean that all of us are suddenly going to spend 90% of our income on charitable causes. That's something that's inherent in us and doesn't change because of technology. Um, another way to think about amplification is that the technology is the mechanism or the engine in our vehicles and we are its drivers. And the most important thing when you're trying to get to a particular destination is not how powerful your engine is, but whether you know where you're going, uh, whether you're safe at operating the vehicle, and ultimately whether you have the capacity to get there. And this is true regardless of the the vehicle that you're driving. So your engine can become more powerful, but ultimately you need somebody who knows how to drive the vehicle and how to do so safely. Um, interestingly, with more powerful technologies, you need more training to use the vehicle better. And in a similar way, as a society, we need to become more sophisticated about our use of technology as the technology becomes more powerful. So once again, technology for the most part um, amplifies underlying human forces. And what that means is that as a direct corollary, uh, it's the human forces underlying all of us, underlying our societies that ultimately matter, and those are the ones that decide which direction uh, the technology's impact ultimately is. And so one question is, what can we anticipate about some of the amazing technologies that are coming up online? And um, as I think is very obvious by you know, this point, uh, a lot of the advances in artificial intelligence and robotics are not happening among everyday uh, users of technology. They are largely being pushed forward by a very small number of extremely powerful corporations, a lot of them technology corporations. And what can we expect from them? Um, on the one hand, we have uh, their statements that they make explicitly to the public. So this is Mark Zuckerberg, who in various uh, capacities seems to be on a mission to make the world a better place uh, by spreading the internet and so forth. He's says in this case that every society there are certain basic services that are so important for people's well-being that we expect everyone to be able to access them freely and his company in fact is trying to provide uh, more, internet, more internet access at a lower cost for more people on the planet. Um, at the same time these companies don't seem to be as interested in uh, protecting society from some of the ills of uh, the internet, uh, some of which, again, Sue mentioned, but there are many other ways in which bad things are happening online, and despite these companies' significant uh, economic and political resources, they are really not addressing these issues, and that's largely because this is not their interest. Their interest is not to make society a better place. I used to work at Microsoft for 12 years, and I have to say that within the company, it was a moral mission for every employee to contribute to the company's profit, but not necessarily to make the world a better place, even though we often try to connect these two things. Um, and I'm going to explain this in a very stark way, referring to yet another piece of science fiction. So how many people have seen the movie The Matrix? Okay, very uh, widely viewed movie. And in the movie, uh, it's a dystopian world. Uh, there is an advanced technology that harvests human energy to feed its machine masters while offering the illusion of a pleasant life. Now, it's science fiction, but I'm going to suggest that that science fiction uh, world is actually much closer to uh, today than we think. So, for example, Facebook is an advanced technology that harvests human energy to feed its shareholders while offering all of us the illusion of a pleasant social life. And I think if you think of these companies in this very stark way, you will begin to realize the role that a lot of uh, technology companies and large corporations are playing. Now, I don't really mean to pick on Facebook. Actually, I probably do. But, um, <laughs> but uh, this is true of every 
uh, not only technology company, but of every corporation. Their goal is not to make the world a better place, however much they might say so. Their goal is to make as much money as possible for their shareholders and to some extent their employees. And you can see that because over the last several decades, um, the same entities that have been in charge of how people get paid have taken a lot of the additional uh, value of increased productivity through technology, but not paid it back to average citizens and even their own employees. And again, I want to say that this is happening during the same time that all of these great technologies are appearing on the scene. So once again, if you believe that technology is the cause of positive change in society, what I'm trying to say is that that might be true, but only if it is under the care of people who really care about making society a better place, and certainly not uh, when entrusted to uh, large corporations. So, um, coming back to the question of uh, amplification, you know, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for uh, uh, more kind of everyday people who, some of us who might be engaged with technology, some of us who care about technology uh, as producers of it, um, but all of us who are ultimately impacted by the decisions of a very small number of corporations. So, uh, let's take another science fiction um, story. This time, my favorite, I'm Japanese. Uh, this is from Godzilla, of course. And basically, we are living in a world in which there are these very large entities, whether they are corporations or governments, and increasingly their decisions are uh, made in a way that really don't take into account either our concerns, or if they do, not in a way that ultimately benefits the vast majority of people. In many ways, this is the rest of us. Okay, these giants are fighting it out, and we are not really in control. Um, now, any time this happens in history, uh, whether it is fights among corporations or fights among governments, basically there is really only one viable solution to fighting back. And that is for the people who don't have a lot of power individually to act collectively to change the situation. And if you look back in history, this has been proven time and time again. Uh, in the case of um, movements against slavery, uh, this was against governments and corporations hold, holding one view, average people holding another view, and organizing in such a way that they could fight against it. Uh, in the case of the women's movement, same situation, a lot of people in power, mostly men, deciding what the situation was, a lot of women to get, uh, working together to fight the situation along with their allies. Uh, in the case of things like uh, vaccination, a lot of the decision making was made by people who were very vested in um, in a better health care, uh, often in a top-down way, but ultimately requires the movement of vast numbers of everyday people, uh, everyday healthcare workers, in order to actually get vaccination done. And these things uh, are easy to forget in an age in which we think that simply by tweeting something online or posting something on the Facebook that goes viral, uh, the world changes. Uh, to some extent, that's true, but I'm also going to suggest that the changes that we really need to cause are much, much deeper than that. They require changes in attitudes, not just among uh, people like ourselves, but among a larger mass of people who might ultimately um, activate and organize in such a way that we'll undo some of the damage that large entities are doing. And so I've always struggled to find a good analogy for uh, what we should think about. And um, increasingly what I'm thinking about is that in many ways, uh, social change and social activism is a little bit like uh, music in that with music, it is extremely obvious that no amount of good technology shortens the amount of time that you need to become a virtuoso musician. Right, so I'm sure there are you know plenty of musicians in this room. You know, most of us. Uh, I took piano lessons when I was a child. You know, we had to practice for hours at, at a time, multiple years before we got to a point where we were even reasonable uh, performers. And music has that tendency. It doesn't make a difference how powerful your metronome is or how great your electric guitar. You still need to practice. You still need to do something to change yourself in order to cause a change. So the question is, what would it take to create a world of virtuoso musicians? And by analogy, could we understand? what it would take to create a world in which everybody cares about some of the social challenges uh, in the world today. So, uh, interestingly, uh, there's a country that has already answered this question for us. Um, in, in the 1970s, uh, this man, Jose Abreu, he was an economist in Venezuela, uh, but also a classically trained mus musician. He saw a situation in Venezuela where uh, the country had quite a few national orchestras uh, that were funded by Venezuelan oil, um, but all of the performers were from Western Europe and from North America. And he said, why is it that, as a country, we 
can't produce our own musicians. And so he did something that every tech startup uh, ha, you know, probably has a thought about, which is he started a garage orchestra. Um, in the first month that he operated, he tried to invite all of his friends as well as children's of his, uh, children of his friends to come together and start practicing music, even if they had no experience with musical instruments. Um, within the first month, apparently, he attracted 70-odd uh, people together, and they would practice for 10 to 12 hours a day just to learn the instruments and to learn to perform together. Um, interestingly, over time, he was actually able to form an actual orchestra, and it gained enough amount of national attention that occasionally visitor, visitors would come, like the president of Mexico, hear the music and say, hey, this is amazing, you know, why don't you come and perform for us? Uh, within a few years, uh, they were being invited to um, major venues across the world, uh, to Carnegie Hall and elsewhere, and over time, he realized that he needed more funding to do this, and so he engaged with different governments, whatever their political views, to ensure that he could continue this uh, program. Um, today, you can go to all kinds of areas of uh, Venezuela. There are something like 400,000 students of this program nationally at any given time. And as you can see in this uh, environment, even in uh, relatively poor urban areas, uh, there is now an entire national uh, interest in classical music. Um, apparently, this is so true that if you go to the rural areas of the country, there are cows named Beethoven and Mozart. Um, and perhaps most amazing is that over the last several years, uh, this country has produced some of the world's most um, esteemed musicians. So, for example, this man, Gustavo Dudamel, was a product of this uh, program called El Sistema. And in 2007, he was um, tapped to become the musical director for the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra, which is one of the best orchestras in the world. So, from in the space of 40 years, this country that had no classical music capacity went to become a classical music powerhouse. And what I believe is that we can do a similar thing for the world as long as we are willing to organize in the same way um, that El Sistema did. So um, what does it mean to organize? Uh, I'm certainly not uh, a specialist in this, but there are a few uh, general rules that I'm going to highlight. And because of this audience, I'm going to write it in a form that you can understand. Uh, while humanity exists, and this is an endless loop that you need to keep doing. Um, the first is to join or form an organization, and it's really critical that there is an organization that is at the heart of any movement because you need something that can sustain despite setbacks uh, and that will keep pushing an agenda uh, regardless of whatever the issue is. And um, you know, I want to mention that you have a really interesting organization in the form of the Internet Foundation of Sweden here. It's possible that this organization might be uh, one of the um, pillars of such a movement. And then the rest is relatively uh, obvious, but you need to to have a very clear, meaningful philosophy about what your goals are, set those goals, and then con continuously kind of increase your base of allies and members, um, start with relatively small uh, issues that you can address and hopefully um, um, triumph in, and then over time uh, tackle in bigger, in bigger issues. Uh, from a lot of my technology-focused colleagues, I always get this question of, oh, okay, that's great. Are, is there any more help on how we can do this kind of thing? And I would say, well, you are sitting on a lot of information. Uh, there's plenty of information online about how to create communities and organize effectively in a political way. So uh, to go back to the matrix, you know, this is really one dystopian possibility for our future. Uh, but of course, science fiction isn't only dystopian. There's also positive um, uh, images of the future. And one of them is uh, provided by Star Trek, in which the future is one in which we are no longer chasing after corporate profits all the time, but looking after our own well-being. What's interesting about Star Trek is that Earth is doing so well that you know the series constantly has to conjure up new and menacing aliens so that we have a real tension and a storyline to address with. Um, but one thing I want to mention is that sometimes in Star Trek, there's this notion that it's the technology that enables this world. And what I want to hopefully have convinced you of is that more technology is not the thing that decides whether or not the technology is used for positive ends. And that constantly requires social and political activism of a kind that it is relatively easy to forget about in a world of technology, but unfortunately, um, it's even more important than ever before. So. Um, uh, I lost my size. Just to um, close, I want to say again that the very basic idea about technology is that it amplifies underlying human forces. And so what that means is that those human forces are extremely critical, especially in a world of advanced 
digital technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. That's really engaging. And um, it shows that there is hope for humans still, even though you can sometimes you know, question that because the past year, working within information and cybersecurity, the past year we have witnessed not just growth in cybercrime, but a proliferation of cyber attacks that is both new and, and disconcerting. So mostly it's about money. But it also have been nation-state attacks as well. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the huge companies like, as I say, Microsoft, Facebook, and others, there was a, a question that was put up by um, Brad Smith, Microsoft's Brad Smith, and he was asking for a digital Geneva convention. Uh, what do you think about an idea? Is that the role of these mega companies to actually protect the civil rights? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I'm always very suspect when large corporations uh, do things that claim to be for humanity as a whole. Um, I don't, it, I, it's not that I don't think they can't do it, uh, but that in the end they're constantly pulled by the tug of having to uh, show a growing bottom line, showing more profits. And so, um, you know, in my experience, that uh, that overshadows everything else that they're doing. And even in many cases, you know, the more public-facing efforts are really to serve their own you know, public image, to improve it and so on. Um, I do think that uh, it's something that, you know, to the extent that they're supporting is a good thing. And uh, what I think is most important in those situations is not to leave it up to the corporations, but for you know, all of us to engage. Uh, in my title, I said that you know, grassroots technologists have to uh, be politically active. And you know, by grassroots, I mean basically everybody in this room, me, you know, anybody who is not the CEO of one of these five or six companies. Yeah, and I was very pleased to see the high thoughts you have about our foundation, so that's very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, a little robot friend for you to bring home. I mean, he looks very static right now, but his name is Brahms, and he hopes to one day lead the Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'll make sure he doesn't take over my home. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.